Hi, I'm Edward Cohen. Welcome to Tangent. Today on Tangent, we have Marshall Cox, founder and CEO at Kelvin, decarbonizing the world's legacy buildings. Hi, Marshall. Where does this podcast find you? Hi, great to be here. I'm in Brooklyn, New York right now. Beautiful. Lots of uh, carbon emissions in New York City, so right place to be. Let's set the stage, Marshall. So buildings account for 60% of overall carbon emission in cities. We have another month with record high temperatures around the world. Pressure on real estate owners, developers, and tenants will only intensify. Before we jump in to the wonderful work and solutions that Kelvin is putting on the market, let's talk first about decarbonization. What is decarbonization? Why should we care about decarbonizing buildings? Sure. So it's a great question. And you, you laid the ground pretty well. So 60% of emissions are, from, are, are in cities. And, and of those emissions, a majority are actually from buildings. And while you mentioned that it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of hot weather and it's getting hotter out there, actually most of the emissions come from heating in the winter. And that's you know, mostly because we burn carbon-based fuels to heat their buildings. So if we're going to tackle that issue, we really need to tackle the issue of, of the energy source for building heating. There are a lot of statistics out there on, on buildings and how, you know, this is, this is a big problem. One of them that I like to highlight is, are the analyses that the estimates for cities in, in 2050, 90% of the buildings that we'll have then have already been built. So most of the buildings we're going to find in our cities and, you know, it's, it's pretty rare we get new cities, right? So it's all these bigger, older cities you're familiar with. Almost all the buildings that will be here in, 50, in, in 20, 30 years are, are already here. And so if they're burning fossil fuels, we need to figure out a way to stop them from burning fossil fuels. And there are some really big barriers to doing that. Um, and so that in general is is the question of decarbonization. How, how do we, while, while that takes many forms, I think one of the, if not the primary question is how do we decarbonize the heating systems for these buildings. Yeah, and we're going to jump into that in a second with Kelvin's cozy radiators and, and other products. Before then, what qualifies as legacy buildings? So for us, it's it's mostly those built before 1960, 1970-ish. And the ones we focus on are those without ducting. So they don't have ductwork. Um, this is most multifamilies um, and, and class, a, class B, class C commercial, not class A. You'll generally know that you're in one of these buildings if you see a radiator for heating. And that could be, you know, baseboard, could be wall mount. There's, there's lots of different forms or radiator takes, but um, older buildings generally have this heating technology. I mean, look, reading about uh, heating radiator technology, uh, which was invented back in 1855 by Franz Singali, a uh, Prussian-born Russian businessman in St. Petersburg. I mean, we're I'm sure we're not using the same exact version of that, but we're still using the same technology pretty much. Uh, is the radiator the Microsoft Excel of HVAC? So actually, <clears throat> um, steam heat goes back to the Roman times. Oh my. I'd say there's two big you know, branches of, of radiator heating. One is steam, which is the really old stuff. And the reason why steam is is useful is because you boil it somewhere and then it it of its own accord rises through a building and gets to the spaces that it needs to get to. Um, it wasn't until World War II that we really developed through the war effort reliable fans and and water pumps, and then these building systems started to transition entirely. Well, actually, not 100%, which is still shocking, but mostly to hot water heating. And so you'll if you're in a radiator heated building, it's either um, steam or hot water, and that demarcation really is when was the system built, more or less. Interesting. Now, in terms of carrots and sticks in this uh, energy transition that we're going through, there's a ton of new industry and, and regulatory standards that apply specifically to multifamily owners and operators. I want to talk about some of those and what are the incentives really for for the multifamily owners and operators to take a leap in in transitioning their buildings and making sure they're decarbonized. Yeah, absolutely. So focusing on the multifamily segment, there have always been incentives for energy efficiency. We're now seeing more incentives, not only for energy efficiency, but decarbonization. Uh, a lot of change is happening right now. Historically, a lot of buildings have been a little bit um, hesitant to do these kind of things. It's hard to get into you know, people's homes. It's scary to change something that's worked for 100 years or something new. And then there's always the question of payback. And, and as you may imagine, there's a lot of noise in the market, right? There's a lot of people selling stuff that they say will save, you know, X and, and it doesn't save at all. There is immense movement. In terms of straight incentives, there are utility incentives and the utility is always incentivized to reduce energy efficiency by spending money. It's one of the, the, the structures that's been built into the utility model in most places. And that's been a primary source of, of incentives. 
uh, previously. There are state and federal programs to incentivize decarbonization. And I think the really exciting things that are coming now with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act primarily is there's a few things. So there's tax credits. You've probably heard of the um, ITC. So these tax credits are are new and extremely valuable for decarbonization technologies in particular, but also other um, energy efficiency measures. And now the upcoming Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which there's not you know enormous details known about it yet, but we will, we will launch in mid-2024. And that's a $27 billion program that will in- entirely change the energy efficiency and decarbonization landscape. Um, and that is super, super exciting. I think we're going to see some really exciting things next year in this in this space. I mean, gradually and then suddenly, right? I think what's being said on the street is that the regulation is, is truly lagging behind the science, but it's it's uh, starting to catch up. Yeah, I would I would I would say a little differently. I mean, what are the incentives? Well, you, you mentioned carrots and sticks, right? One of the sticks that that um, we did not I didn't talk about yet is Local Law 87, right right here in New York City, one of the most aggressive, you know, carbon emission laws that that came into place. And it comes into effect in 2024. So what it originally was, was that if you emitted more carbon per square foot of your building than, than you're allowed, you'd pay a fine. They're kind of pulling back on the fine aspect of it because, and then there's good reason, right? Like I, I know a lot of people who are, you know, at the top levels implementing this law and, and, and they've said to me, you know, for instance, co-ops, like low-income communities in, in, in New York City, they're, they're like our children. You don't, you don't want to punish your children you want to like coax them into into being better, right? And so one of the things that they might be changing Local I 7 to do is if you are over the limit, but you can show that you're on a path to becoming, to going under the limit, you won't get a fine, right? There is even some talk about those fines being being identified by saying, hey, just spend this on energy efficiency and you'll be good too, right? Like, so there's a lot of ways that, that they're trying to make the, the stick less of a stick and more than a carrot, I guess. I, I don't know what the red analogy is, but... Um, yeah, tons of stuff changing. Fascinating. Now let's talk about how you're how you're assisting multifamily owners and operators in this transition, and how you're making an impact in cities becoming decarbonized. So, Kelvin, up until early this year, you were you had deployed your smart radiator technology across 120 buildings, over 15,000 posies, as you call your staple product. But you didn't start there. This has been a long journey. Uh, I want you to take us back to to the beginnings, you know, how how this came to be and how we got to where we are now. Yeah, sure. So I, I actually started the company in 2012. Um, I was getting my my uh, PhD at Columbia. It's something that had nothing to do with heating. And absolutely, <laughs> I, I, if you're familiar with like QLED TVs, like the Samsung QLED, I was at a company that they acquired. So I, my expertise is in one and two dimensional um, materials in, in conjunction with semiconductor materials. So it's, it's like very specialized. But... I lived in a horrible steam heated apartment and it was <laughs> just really, really bad. Um, and I have a twin brother who was staying with me and can, wouldn't stop complaining. So I built this first system <laughs> that goes over the radiator, controls how much air gets blown into the room or hot air gets blown into the room. Worked super well. Um, we kind of partnered with Columbia University, deployed it in the building, um, made a lot of mistakes in that deployment, but learned a lot and then won a really big, uh, the MIT Clean Energy Prize in 2012, which was um, a couple hundred thousand dollars that we used to really launch the company and deploy. It has been a long road. It's considered a new technology, so we had to go through the entire, you know, certification route, which many people may not know is long and arduous. So NYSERDA studied the technology for five years. They studied the report. The, the first report they published on on our technology, which they started studying in 2013, was published in 2018, which is a very long time in startup world. And then we got into the technical resource manual, which was a very big and exciting step for us in December of 2000. And 19. So then we had to wait until COVID was over to actually start deploying. So most of those deployments, I'd say 90% plus, were actually since 2021. Uh, so it's only then that we've really been growing rapidly. Really, really puts things into perspective. No no such thing as a overnight success and really focus and, and patience uh, really pays off. Yeah, as one of my earliest investors put it, you know, rare labs and overnight success um, after 10 years, <laughs> right? That's right. That's right. That's, uh, yeah, it's almost like... Uh, smile and and keep going um exactly. now specifically smart radiators heat pumps thermal batteries um all these are promising to save money uh for owners and operators and reduce carbon emissions uh so let's talk about uh, the smart radiators uh how do these work um how do you install them um who's a good candidate yeah so the the radiator covers are fairly simple they're insulating boxes with a thermostatically controlled fan 
So we deploy them in most of a building and, and actually let me take a step back. So if you're, if you're in a radiator heated building, there's a radiator somewhere in your building, this will, will increase the efficiency of the building pretty dramatically between 25 and 40%. Um, and, and improve con comfort a ton. And the reason is that in these buildings, you know, there's a relatively uncontrolled distribution of heat. And, and you can walk around New York and you can look up in, in the middle of the winter and see a ton of open windows. Um, that's because most apartments have to get overheated in order to minimally heat the coldest apartments. So if you underheat someone, if their apartment's under 68 degrees for more than you know a certain amount of time, that person doesn't have to pay rent if they can prove that. And so no building is going to let that happen. So everybody who's at 80, 85, we've been in apartments that are 90 degrees, they're that hot because the building is making sure that no one's going to not pay rent. And what the smart radiator cover does is we deploy it throughout the building, ideally in those hot, hot rooms. And when the room gets to a comfortable temperature, it just turns the fan off. And, and the function of the insulated box thereafter is to stop more heat from getting into the room. And what that does on the building distribution scale is it, it stops steam from traveling and, and condensing or hot water from transferring heat in those hot rooms, which means that that energy gets more efficiently to the cold rooms, um, heats them up faster, your overall consumption of of, boil, of steam, you know, you, you boil or, or heat up less water over a boiler cycle and that over a winter season um, translates to a savings between, you know, 25 to 40%. Uh, Lord Kelvin uh, would be proud. Um, sure. So <laughs> in terms of, uh, so we, this, this translates to increased profitability for, for building owners, essentially. Yeah. So, so our, you know, we get the question whether we're B2C or B2B. We're B2B because um, in these buildings, uniquely, uh, the tenants, and, and let's focus on multifamily, the tenants do not pay for, for heat. They pay for heat through rents. The building pays for heat. And so we're selling it to the building who, you know, pays the natural gas heating bill. And when we reduce the, the, the consumption of natural gas by, you know, 30% reduce their heating bill by 30%. And that's one of the one of the largest I actually think it is the largest you know single cost to the building besides potentially insurance costs, right? It's, it's an enormous part of their operating expense. And so if we can make a make a case that we're going to save more than than the cost over a period of time, awesome. They're 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 all in, right? And we actually launched last year a subscription model because we have so much data on how much we save. We could actually deploy the technology for zero dollars to customers and have them pay us a small monthly fee that is, uh, I'd say, you know, almost always, if not always, below their savings. And we finance that through partners who who have seen our savings over, you know, ten years of, of data, and also trust that it, it will save that we say it's going to save. Anticipating my next question, which is, uh, how how are we financing these? How can multifamily owners uh, cover these costs and, and realize the gains? Yep, that's um. So so we actually do focus on the LMI market. A mission of our company is to allow it enable energy efficiency, but but what we'll get to next, so I assume decarbonization for those those markets that do not have the cash stockpile to 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 participate. Um, that obviously translates to to market rate as well. But we are heavily invested with finance partners in deploying this for no money down with an affordable, low cost monthly fee that is a, a tiny minute fraction of the rents that these these buildings typically charge. Here on Tangent, we always uh, champion collaborations and, and partnerships where incentives are aligned for all stakeholders. Kelvin here deploying uh, you know incentives not only for the owners and the operators of real estate, but also the the uh, the renters, uh, the residents. Absolutely. Yeah. And keep in mind that these I mean these tenants have never people in these buildings have never had control over the temperature, right? So like they're they're hot, they're cold, they're hot. We give them every customer um, that we deploy this technology for the the residents get a free app that gives them full thermostatic control over their temperature with scheduling, right? So just as if they had a Nest thermostat in their wall, they can they can program the times, what temperatures they want their apartment to be. And while you know you're you're at the whim of the technology, the baseline technology, these buildings are so much more comfortable. It's it's like a new building. So this is also a tenant uh, attraction and tenant retention strategy. That's right. Amazing. Can you talk a bit more specifically about the type of partnerships you're forming to to finance the deployment of these solutions, and and also just at large, you know, in terms of uh, decarbonizing the the buildings? Yeah, so um, there are there are many organizations that that lend money for for projects like this. Um, they come in a lot of different forms. We're 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 speaking to a group for a very large um, project equity fund that we'll be signing and, and announcing over the next month or so. 
Um, there's always the Green Bank. There's the DOE loan program. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund will be like all these things on steroids when it comes out. So there's there's public, there's private sources, and, and you just find the ones that will work with you at whatever size, you know, whatever scale you're working at and give you the best economics. But yeah, I mean, if you want to look for a model that is that is very transparent and, and obvious, it's the Green Bank, right? The Green Bank funds a lot of these programs. Um, that started as to the DU loan program is really big. It's, it's the the federal program, right? So yeah, I'd say, I'd say who you talk to depends on what stage of, of, of your company is at. Interesting. Let's shift gears a little here. Is there any uh, maintenance uh, upkeep that is required for COSIs? Very little. So the only moving part my PhD is in electrical engineering. So the, the electronics portion are rock solid. We do not use electrolyte capacitors for those who are in the know. You're not going to evaporate your electronics. They stop working after a couple of years. Um, we use things that are built to last. The only moving part we have is a fan. Fans have a rated lifetime to fail over about 15 years. So we're designing these things to last as long as possible. But further than that, we design them so that the electronics package is removable easily from the the, the product at large. So we're monitoring at all times how fast the fan is moving, the temperatures throughout the system, um, other sensors reading reasonable data, and we're looking for problems to spot before they actually become an issue. And so we'll have an alert system for buildings that says, hey, this this cozy fan is 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 decaying and needs to be replaced, and we'll send an alert, and that will be just be swapped out. So yes, there is maintenance, um, but a significant portion of our platform is designed to see problems before they become actual issues and mitigate those issues through low-cost replacement. And I'll only add um, that our subscription model is we, we guarantee performance. So we will replace those systems. That's part of the cost. One or even two steps ahead here, uh, especially in you know with lots of uh, multifamily buildings out there looking to just improve the bottom line as you know interest rates basically don't allow them to refinance or a lot of these buildings are are underwater and if they're looking for ways to just improve their bottom line and, and their operations efficiency, Kelvin Kelvin is the way to go. Exactly. And and we are very careful to make sure that none of what we're doing requires, you know, a lien or in the building. There's no financial burden to them other than that, that monthly fee, which again is very low. Marshall, you're a doctor in electrical engineering from Columbia. Somewhat challenging the notion that startup founders shouldn't follow traditional education paths. Tell us why your team is uniquely positioned to lead the, the charge in the energy transition. So I think it's both, I'd say my training has helped me and hurt me a lot in this mission. We are very results and data-based. So when we say we're going to save, you know, 25 to 40%, that's not a hand wavy 25 to 40%. We will tell you exactly how much we're going to save via an equation that not only we've honed over 10 years of, 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 of development, but that we published in the New York State TRM. If you look at the, the, the this is the manual that, that all the utilities have to look at to calculate how much you're going to save. I, I'm not sure there's many other technologies that have an equa- has an equation that will literally calculate how much you'll save based on, on a few parameters from the building. It's like that precise and, and it's very accurate. So I'd say that when we say what we're going to do, we can do it. And that is in part because of my education and my belief that you know, you should, the science behind something should be very, very rigorous. On the other hand, I am very precise, right? So when I pitch the company, I'm not going to say, oh, we'll be worth $10 billion in three years. Like, that's ridiculous. It, I'm, I'm very careful and conservative <laughs> when I say those estimates. And that's almost certainly hurt us in, in, in our fundraising over the past 10 years, right? So being an engineer and, and not being comfortable with exaggeration, let's put it that way, kind of puts you out of the mainstream in, in most of these startup and startup culture. Probably the thing that any guest in Tangent has ever said that I feel the most identified with in terms of this truth hyperbole world that, that we live in and also kind of we, we want to be dreamers and we want to tackle the biggest challenges. Uh, so right. we got to be ambitious. However, do we always need to kind of over overstate or overestimate because of the human condition of loving storytelling? Exactly. And, 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 you know, like I'm sure you've heard the, the haircut that all investors apply to estimates from, from startup founders. Um, it's a little unfair when, when you get the general haircut filter and you're trying to be more accurate, right? <laughs> yeah. You almost want to maybe anticipate that you're like, okay, here are the pre haircut predictions. And then here are the post haircut. Uh, you right. both, both are accurate. Just choose if you want the haircut or not. Exactly. 
let's shift gears again in terms of hybrid electrification and decarbonizing buildings. What uh, what are you working on there? So yeah, so this is the um, so basically, I'd say our Series A is predicated um, somewhat heavily on this, right? Like we are going to be a big business with the cozy, but over the course of our experience in buildings, um, and we have a ton. We probably have more experience installing some people's apartments than than most people, right? We've done so many of these things. We've come face to face with the barriers of electrification for these buildings, and they are enormous, right? Even the costs, even forgetting the costs, and the cost to to electrify these buildings is out of this world. And it's not because heat pumps are expensive; they're not. It's the cost of implementing them, running new electric, blasting a hole in the wall. Remember, these are where people live. Like you can't do this kind of stuff in New York City. Of all the buildings that are our market, which is about seventy percent of New York City, one percent, one building has de- decarbonized. It's in the NYU dorm. They moved everybody out for you know thirty months. And they, um, and it, you know, they have more money than, you know, who knows. So there were those barriers were were not there because they could move everybody out and they have a million and billions of dollars. That is a real big problem in the context of decarbonization. So when we look at this problem, money is a cost, financial financial capability is an issue, but more so than that, it's actually the the entrenched process barriers that the buildings have to actually even evaluate and 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 upgrade their buildings. So if you have a building, you spent money on a boiler. And that boiler was a lot of money, and you're not going to replace it until it dies. And that's true of single family, right? Like, if you own a home, like, when's the last time you replaced a heating system outside of a failure or a huge renovation? Like, never. Um, and these buildings are even worse than that. I would say not even worse. They, they are this on steroids. Buildings don't replace their boilers until they die. When does a boiler die? Almost always in the middle of the winter. And when it dies in the middle of the winter, it's an utter emergency. Because if they don't heat their tenants, they're not paying rent. So they just get whatever was there replaced. They don't even consider a sustainable upgrade. And they lock themselves in to 15 or 20 more years of, of natural gas consumption. And so the way we're approaching it with hyper electrification is we're saying, okay, we're all we're in these apartments no matter what. Um, let's take people's crappy air conditioners, window or sleeve air conditioners, and let's replace them with a commodity window or sleeve heat pump. Not cold climate. This isn't going to heat your apartment year round. It's the, th- the one you can basically buy from Home Depot right now. And it plugs into your outlet. And Let's run that heat pump when it's over 32 Fahrenheit outside, so we don't have to deal with freezing condensate. And then when it gets really cold, we'll turn the steam or uh, water system back on. We'll use the radiator. So we can get, um, it turns out about above 32 Fahrenheit, that's about 70, 75% of the BTUs required for heating in a building. So we can deploy this for about 5 or 10% of the implementation cost. That means we can get 70% heating decarbonization for 5 or 10% of the cost of a traditional electrification system. So that's great. And we can do that now. We don't have to wait for the boiler to die. Um, and that overcomes the, the sunk cost fallacy with these buildings, right? They're like, oh, great, we're still using your boiler. What we're bringing to that mix is we're adding a thermal battery to the to the window or sleeve heat pump. And that lets us do two things. It lets us participate in demand response programs. You know, Con Ed and utilities will pay you a lot of money to turn off a load during peak air conditioning seasons. And that's actually enough money to entirely pay for the deployment of the technology. So we're literally working towards a low or no cost electrification solution for all of this building types. Then for the rest of the year, we use that battery that we have to, to do what's called time of use optimization. It lets us shift um, conditioning load to an off-peak time or even in the middle of the night. And that reduces the operating cost for a building below to, to or below natural gas heating costs. So instance ROI for everybody involved paid for by the utilities. That's stage one. And that's awesome. We can do all these buildings for no cost to the customer and it's de-risk, right? If they worry that these things aren't going to work in the middle of the winter, oh, well, you're using your boiler. Like, no problem. But that's stage one. So stage two is then we plot a course. Okay, what does this building look like when it's when the boiler dies and we do want to fully electrify it? So we plot out the course for that best market fit electrification solution. We tell the customer like, hey, this is what you should do when your boiler dies. Want to do it now? And they're going to be like, no. So great. When the boiler does die, we're going to know first because we're controlling it. That's what we do today. Tell the customer your boiler just died. It's the middle of the winter. Don't worry. It's not an emergency because we have this backup heating system in every room in your building. Here is the the solution we we socialize with you. This is why it's the best ROI for you. Um, here's our partners who can do it. Press this button. We'll implement it now. And all of the heat pumps that we've deployed, and this is part of our design criteria, are designed to be the terminal unit, not only for hybrid electrification, but also for that final full electrification solution, whatever that solution is. So you've already installed half the system. All the terminal units, the thermal batteries, the demand response capabilities remain through that transition. And we think that by doing that, we'll not only get Huge amounts of decarbonization now, which is an enormous win, but we will set these buildings up 
with a soft op ramp from carbon based fuels to vastly increase the percent of buildings that actually decarbonize when that boiler does die. Fascinating in terms of how you approach, uh, you know, adoption, right? I think you you set out this this very clear path uh, for multifamily owners and operators to to follow, and and they don't need to wait for for uh, the boiler to die. They don't need to wait for that, you know, moment of urgency, right? Exactly. We're, we're creating a de-risked soft off ramp for buildings from carbon based fuels, and that is the that is what is required to make this happen. I like that vision, and you're making it happen. Last but not least, you hinted at this, but how does Kel, how is Kelvin, uh, you know, elevating uh, the living experience uh, for renters? You mentioned the free app. You mentioned that a lot of these renters have never before controlled the temperature of their own apartments that they're paying a ton of money for. Uh, so, can you describe a bit more, you know, how how you're elevating the living experience for for renters? Yeah, it's comfort and control, right? It's it's letting them have a little bit more control over the place where they live. You don't even know, need to go beyond that. You've, I've, I've assumed I've lived in an apartment like this, right? Like it's super hot in the middle of winter. You open the window, it's cold, it's hot. Like it is <laughs> miserable to live in under those conditions. So giving people the control to be comfortable in their own home in and of itself is an enormous amenity. Absolutely. People, people really like it. Yep. I've been uh, stuck in a bar mitzvah where uh, according to the calendar, it was already winter, but according to real life, it was super, super hot still, and there was no way of controlling the temperature in that room. And exactly. everyone was in a suit and tie, and everyone was extremely sweaty. Well, exactly. Collaboration superpower. Marshall, if you could choose one person, historic or living, to do a partnership with, who would it be? And you can't pick Elon or Steve Jobs. I, I wouldn't pick him anyway. Yeah, I mean, like, this is a really tough question. You could lean towards, like, Thomas Edison, like, amazing inventor. You could lean towards... You know, people like Chigger Shah, who we know and is awesome. Like, who could we partner with right now that could, like, supercharge our the business case and make this happen? It could be people like Chigger Shah who have, who have done this for solar. And, and there are many um, parallels between the solar development ecosystem and, and what we're trying to do. Or you could choose, you know, somebody like a huge heat pump company that, um, and, and I don't know how a single individual, but but who have the resources to, to deploy these things at massive scale. Um, I would lean towards Jigger. He's a great guy. Um, he's done this before. He knows how to do it and has all the connections to make it happen. Uh, I think that's my go-to. Jigar Shaw, the co-founder and president of General, Generate Capital. That's right. Fascinating. And, and deep solar solar background. And I think he's at the DOE Leon program right now running that, um, or at least he was recently. He, he moves around a lot. Yeah. Director of Loan Programs Office in the U.S. Department of Energy. Jigar, tune into Tangent and reach out to Marshall and Kelvin. Awesome. Marshall Cox, founder and CEO at Kelvin. Thank you so much for coming to Tangent today. Thank you so much for your time. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review Tangent and share the show with a friend. This episode is produced by me, Edward Cohen. Thanks for listening to Tangent. And remember, collaboration is our superpower. So stay curious and always be learning.